So we're reading Jeremiah, and we have finished up that first prophecy, and we are on the next prophecy. Um, it starts in chapter 3, verse 6. If anybody got a chance to read chapter 3 and 4. Um, it, so it, th this prophecy is only really verses 6 to through like 10, through 10. And uh, it, so it's relatively short, and we're only going to look at the one. We're not going to start the same one. Um, and so it dates early, just like la just like the, uh, the last, uh, the first prophecy did, around 620, 625, somewhere in there. Um, it's it's under King Josiah still, so it's still the first king that uh, that Jeremiah prophesied uh, under. Uh, and this is the same king that was doing those religious reforms. Um, so, okay, in the days of King Josiah, the Lord asked me, Have you seen what unfaithful Israel has done? She has ascended every high hill and gone under every green tree to prostitute herself there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me. But she didn't return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So let me kind of explain what's going on here with Judah and Israel. Israel was God's people, the twelve tribes, but they had become a nation, and that nation had split into two parts. There was the northern tribe, northern uh, nation, which was Israel, and the southern nation, which was Judah. And um, Israel was by far more wicked. Uh, but uh, rather than learning from Israel's mistakes, Judah just kind of kept on repeating them. And um, so Israel was destroyed before Judah. Israel was destroyed by the Syrian Empire, and, and Judah was, was destroyed by the uh, Babylonian Empire. It says here, um, right here, uh, I thought after she, after she has done all, this, all these things, she'll return to me. And that kind of gives us the idea that, that, you know, God didn't know what was going to happen because of how it really translates in, in the... In the English and, and kind of how we think, um, we, which this translation is a little bit misleading. It's not like God was like fooled or he didn't know what was going to happen. It's not like God was like wrong about the future. That's not the, not what it's saying. It's more of more of a way of saying I'm going to give them the chance to turn. It's just that it doesn't really come across that way in this translation of the English. So I just thought I'd kind of clarify that. Um, he definitely did know that they weren't going to turn. It's just kind of a way of talking, like, "Ah, oh, well, let's see." You know, it's like, "Well, no, not really." Um, so, okay, and then it says here, "She will return to me." Um, this is a very important point because remember that that um, we kind of have some, sometimes this idea that God is like this this really judgmental God, and yet here we see a picture of Israel and Judah as a whole nation, God's people, all turning away from God and rebelling and, and living in sin, and yet you still see God like just waiting for them to come back, not waiting to destroy them, waiting for them to, to come back um, so that he can, you know, restore them. And in the same way, God waits for us when, when we mess up too. Um, it's not like he's waiting to punish us or something. This was something that had gone on for hundreds of years. He sent a bunch of prophets, they just weren't listening. Um, and then there's obviously the, the point here that sin uh, doesn't ever satisfy us. Um, so after she has done these things, she will return to me. She'll get bored of it. Uh, so then verses 8 and 9, I observed that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery that I had sent her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. Nevertheless, her treacherous sister Judah was not afraid, but also went and prostituted herself. Indifferent to her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. So there's a few things here. I observed, it could also be translated, she observed, in which case it would read this. But she didn't turn, that would be Israel. Israel didn't turn, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Judah observed, she observed, that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery that had sent her away. Um, but if that's if the, if it if it is right to translate it as I observed, then the point here would be um, it was obvious, not that God like hadn't seen it, but it was an obvious thing. And then it says here, um, I sent her away and, ha and had given her a certificate of divorce. Now, um, God is talking in, in marriage terms to kind of get the point across. What what, what that means that he you know sent sent a uh, certificate of divorce was when Assyria came and conquered the northern kingdom that was he was kicking them out of the land it was that was what he's talking about with the certificate of divorce and it says here um, towards the end uh, indifferent to her prostitution she defiled the land um, sin sin is a natural thing that happens in us it's something that we are drawn to something we experience naturally it's something that we are we um, we always justify it in our own minds. It's not that big of a deal. It's not something that uh, we need to worry about. It's just something that, that we kind of accept in, in our life. And um, when we don't read the Bible and that kind of stuff, we just 
go by whatever seems good to us at the time. So um, a lot of times when we're reading the Bible, we'll see things in there that, that, that definitely go against what's natural for us to believe. Um, like, for instance, it's very easy to believe that, you know, I can, I can save myself. I can, I can figure things out on my own, that my, I, can, I can, you know, live my life in a way that is, um, that I can figure my, my own way out. I don't need somebody else's guidance and direction. But then in the Bible, it, it talks us about all these different things about, you know, leaning on God and trusting in God. And um, and we always make it where it is, uh, where sin is not a big deal. And then it says here at the very end, with, um, she committed adultery with stones and trees. Um, this is referring to idols and the common materials used on idols. So the last uh, part, and this closes off, this is the end of this prophecy. So you can see how this one is significantly shorter than some of the other ones. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord announced to me, unfaithful Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. And that verse starts off the next prophecy. So we're going to stop right there. Um, but I just want to kind of focus on a few things here before we do. And so that's why I didn't end on verse 10. It says here um, that J Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. And um, pretense, if you don't know what pretense means, is basically like a, a deception or a mask. Um, so you could say, well, I hate you, but I'm giving you a pretense of loving you. It's like giving a front of doing something. So how do you come to God in pretense? Does anybody have any ideas on that? I just told you. Maybe like... Do, do you want me to tell you again? or? Okay. Uh, pretense means being like deceptive or ha having like a mask. So you could say like, for instance, let's say I hate you, but I'm giving off a pretense of loving you. I'm pretending to love you. Like saying kind of one sense? thing but doing another? Kind of, kind of. So how do you come to God in pretense? Because it says here, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, but came in pretense. Uh, Gracie, were you about to say something? Yeah, uh, maybe like, say like the church has like an altar altar call sure and you go up there and you're acting like you're you're wanting to change and stuff like that in front of the other people to you know show them how close you are to god and stuff sure but in actuality you're you're inside you're not really yeah that's sure. a good example that'd be a very good example another example that i can give you right off the top of my head <laughs> i have notes here for other examples but something i just thought off the top of my head is sometimes when you're leading a ministry like you're a pastor or different things like that you can get to a point where you um you're just not really dedicated to God. You don't really even like people anymore. and uh, But you know you have to like keep up the facades to the people, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be serving people with pretense. Um, so some examples, uh, prayers that you don't mean. Looking good, but inside having a pride for an unforgiving heart. I actually grew up with a lot of people who did stuff like this. They would come to church wearing these suits and stuff and dresses and just looking real sharp. And then, you know, the whole time they would be judging you and talking down to you and gossiping and all this stuff. And it's like, well, it's, that would be serving God in pretense. Um, worshiping and doing religious things like, oh, I'm going to sing songs in service. I'm going to, you know, look the part uh, without really changing how I treat others um, and what I'm, how I'm living my life. Um, God has this thing where he doesn't expect us to, um, it's not that he expects us to be perfect. That's not the point. But um, how it, basically, our heart and our dedication to God is shown by how we treat other people and how we, how we live our lives. You know, we can, it's easy to sit, to sit and say, oh, I'm so holy and righteous because I read the Bible all day. But then to go out and treat people like crap and to, you know, go out and, and, and just do things that, that aren't glorifying to God, they're just glorifying to yourself. And uh, th th definitely not, not talking about never messing up, you know. Um, I, I know some Christians who they literally go to pieces, oh, I forgot to read the Bible today, I didn't pray today, ah. Oh. No, that's more, that's, if you're having a problem k keeping a, a, a devotional life of reading the Bible and praying, that's more of an issue with, with not being a responsible person or a disciplined person. You wreck discipline. It, it doesn't. It doesn't have. <laughs> it doesn't have too much to do. <laughs> it's something that uh, that growing up in California, I experienced a lot. I thought you were gonna say like Scooby Doo or something. Um, but it, it's not so much a thing of you know you're sinning. 
it, it that's just more of needing to you know put checks in, in place um, so the question that is interesting to ask is this last verse right set over here says the, the lord announced to me unfaithful israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous judah so the question becomes how is judah more wicked than destroyed israel remember there's two nations israel was destroyed because they were wicked and judah was slightly more slightly more righteous at a time but now he's saying that they're more wicked than israel so any ideas there guys how is judah more wicked than than israel which was destroyed Any ideas? You want to take a guess, Nicole? No? Well, there are no fewer than five reasons. Ha! <laughs> Number one, Judah had been a nation for longer, so they had longer to sin. It's a simple mm. thing there. Number two, Israel by and large was a, was a heathen nation from its start, but Judah had opportunity but sinned anyways. They they had the law, they knew what was right, and they just didn't do it. And then the law was found, jo Josiah did this reform, and still the people are not really seeking God. So they had plenty of opportunity, they just didn't seize the opportunity. So obviously, um, God judges people harsher who, who, ha who could have done the right thing but didn't. You know what I mean? Than somebody who never had the chance to do the right thing. So a good example of this would be: um, is he gonna is he gonna judge somebody who's like let's say fourteen who didn't adopt somebody? Well, no. But if you have somebody who's like twenty five and and is should should adopt somebody and knows that they should has the money and the ability to adopt somebody and they're just you know God even tells them hey adopt this person and they say no I'm not gonna help this person. Well then that God's gonna judge that person harsher even though they both did the same thing. Um, so then number three, they, they Judah saw Israel's punishment. They, he, they saw what God did, but they didn't change. They didn't learn from it. To see the error of your ways and still not change the error of your ways is a greater sin. Uh, number four, even though King Josiah was pushing for religious reforms, he was trying to do all this stuff and national repentance and all this, he was really trying to push people back to God, they didn't listen and they didn't learn. Um, so a good example of that would be someone who, who has heard about Jesus in church but leaves is a greater sinner, sinner than those in the world who have never heard. So like if you've been saved, if you've been in a church your whole life and you call yourself a Christian but you have a nasty, bitter attitude, God's going to judge you harsher than the person who is in the world that was never saved. Because you, they didn't have the same opportunity that you had. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and then number five, they repent. They pretended to repent as Josiah was doing all this stuff, going through all the motions and stuff. But they didn't really come to God. It was more like a show to appease, you know, the situation. And uh, so they were liars too, and they were they were hypocrites. So they were adding that onto their sin as well. So sometimes when we're reading the prophet books. It's not uncommon to, to say something along the lines of this. You know, that sounds harsh. I and mean, if, if you ever read the prophet books, prophetic books, you're going to come to a point where you say, you know, that, that just kind of sounds a little harsh. Here's the thing. The, these, these words were given to God's people, and they weren't listening. God's people, the ones that were supposed to have the law and know God and serve him, they just weren't listening. And... Um, so not only were they not listening, but they were God's people and they weren't listening. What would you do if a train was coming and someone was on the tracks? I mean, wouldn't you try and yell and holler to get them off the tracks? Wouldn't, wouldn't you do something? That's really what we see God doing here. They've been, they've been disobeying for year after year. Things are going from bad to worse. They're still not learning. They're still not listening. And so God is trying everything, everything to get them to turn and repent. And... You know, so now that we're not in the situation, it sounds a little bit harsh to us. But in the situation, it really wasn't that harsh. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, uh, verse 10 finishes off that, that prophecy, and verse 11 picks up the next prophecy. And we'll stop there, and in two weeks we'll look at that prophecy. Um, but let, let's, let's look at this question here. Um, I have numerous answers that I thought of, but I would like to more hear what you guys have to say.
the people Jeremiah prophesied, prophesied to were very spiritual people. They were very, very religious people. They did things like they had idols everywhere. They, they, they had these festivals to honor the gods, and they, they did all these sacrifices. And um, when you compare them to us, it kind of leaves a little bit, a little bit wanting. Like, what message does Jeremiah have for people like us? We don't have religious festivals out in the streets. You know, we don't have these like uh you know idols and stuff all around like they did we don't we don't offer sacrifices or at least i hope you don't <laughs> i hope you don't aren't okay. offering sacrifices i hope um <laughs> so what message does jeremiah have for us i want to hear what you guys have to think about that uh, to be kind to one another uh, why why Celebrity. <laughs> As you would a child. <laughs> what do you guys think? Okay. How does that... How does that correlate to the question? I mean, I'm not making fun of you. I'm just... I don't, I don't understand. So, the, the question is... The question is that Jeremiah who lived, you know, thousands of years ago, 2,500 years ago, uh, is giving these prophecies to people who were very religious people. But our culture is not all that religious. So how, what, what, what message does Jeremiah have for us? Like, how can we read Jeremiah and say, oh, this is still for us today, 2,500 years later? Like, was that a sneeze? Well, I think we can make idols out of different things that we don't realize. Okay. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit? In a way, we do carry them around anyways. <laughs> so Go ahead. Um, for instance, um, do we spend um, do we spend most of our time doing things that glorify God, or do we do, spend most of our time doing things that glorify ourselves and other people? Um, do we care more about you know the latest pop star, or do we care more about you know? Um, different things that are going on with, you know, church related things, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and then as far as like sacrifices and stuff, um no there's not as really as many sacrifices anymore, but there are people that are in like wicked and stuff like that. And they do do small type type things and they some of them say they're Christians and no. They're not really Christians, and we can tell that they're not really Christians, but some people still believe that they're Christians just because they say they are. And I think we need to, you know, line up with the Bible and say, actually, this person's not a Christian because they're practicing witchcraft. Right, right. Yeah. There was uh, actually someone who I was dealing with somewhat recently that was um, calling themselves the Christians, but they were still doing these, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, not rituals, but... Um, spells they were still doing these spells and they were having demonic attacks and everything and they couldn't figure it out you know so then they get a shaman to come visit them when they were having these demonic attacks i mean things like that and this person still today calls himself a christian when they're doing all this stuff and it's like part of being a christian is leaving your practices if you're still living your life your way yes yeah, so i i'm i'm totally right in fact that's right here on one of my things point number five we all have idols. If I eat right and exercise, I won't have any problems with my health. Well, what do we spend our time and money on? What do we worship? What do we think about? What do we live for? That's exactly what I have here on my note. Uh, were you going to say something? You started to. In a way, like I said, kind of leaps. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, this is all they think about. Mm -hmm. I have to be on my phone. I have to be on my phone. I, it's something I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get better about not being on my phone. All the time. Very addictive. It's very addictive. Um, but a lot of these mega churches and these bigger churches think that they're exempt from the wrath of God. Mm. Can you um, elaborate a little bit? I, they think that because they're a church mm -hmm. and that they worship God, that they can do no wrong. Okay. Um. It sounds like you have something specific on your mind. I had a dream when I first, I don't know if you remember this or not. When I first started coming to this church, mm -hmm. that a tornado was coming towards the church and people were calling it the wrath of God. Okay. And with all the stuff that's been coming up in the church lately, with all these people leaving and causing drama, it just kind of came back up in my mind a little mm -hmm. bit. 
And you see all these mega churches that they say that they're a Christian church, mm -hmm. but they worship money. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes along with what Gracie was saying. They worship money. They worship technology. They don't really worship God. Okay. And they think they're exempt from the wrath of God. So... I get what you're saying, but could you give me like example, like how how do you feel like they are uh, worshiping technology or worshiping money or? Joel Osteen. Okay, example. that's a good example. Prosperity gospel. Sure. Yeah. You know, you pray this way, you'll be rich. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a big one for sure. Yeah. You know, he for sure worships money. I mean, you can just by the way he acts with you know mm -hmm. his mansions, his planes. <laughs> I don't like trolls. I mean, I I was picking up on that. <laughs> um, I never have. Um, just because I see how he mm -hmm. he teaches and what he teaches. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you have to pay to get into a church, there's something not right. Mm. Yeah. No. See, I, I, I think you shouldn't have people pay to get in. I think you should lock the doors and have them pay to get out. <laughs> Just kidding. Do the middle thing, too. <laughs> I'm, totally, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, did you guys have any anything to contribute to this discussion? Eli? No? Dylan? Okay, just okay. I just wanted to give you guys a chance. So some things that I that I thought of myself, uh, uh, unless you guys had something else you were going to say. Um, okay, so first off, one one lesson that I get from Jeremiah is that God is patient and loving when we mess up. Y you know, you see him continually preferring to give numerous warnings than outright punishment. I mean, like, he waited, little things went wrong, he gave warnings, all this stuff happened. How many times do we as as parents, you know, maybe you guys aren't parents, but I mean, you have... you. <laughs> you guys have you guys have helped with younger siblings. Okay, so with that being said, how many times, or or even I could even ask it differently. How many times have you seen your parents lose their cool with saying the same thing over and over and over again? You see what I mean? Like, I mean, we all do it. It's not like, oh, your parents suck. I mean, we all. When you have your own kids, it'll happen with you too. Um, it's one of those things where we just kind of lose our cool. But we see God doing this like continual warning thing through years. Remember, Jeremiah prophesied forty years. We can read the book in a matter of a matter of a couple days, but it took forty years. This is a lot of stuff that, that's happening, warning after warning after warning. And they're just not listening. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I'm good. I'll get some hot t hot tea in a little bit. Um, so, you know, especially, um, I, I used to say this comment all the time and I, and I've been trying not to say it anymore. I, 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 I used to, I used to always say, I, I say things one time and then you do it. And I've been trying to stop saying it because no, no kid's going to learn it the first time. And God is so patient with us about stuff. And I really think that's one thing that, that I've learned a lot from in Jeremiah. And I think that kind of relates with everybody, um, that, they were messing up. God was being patient with them. When we mess up, God's still patient with us. And I think that that's something that 2,500 years doesn't change. Um, so then another thing that I, I've learned from Jeremiah is that, you know, we always think that we are okay. Like, if you, if you, if somebody asks you, hey, how are you doing? What are you going to say? Well, I'm fine. Like, I'm doing okay. Uh, that's, that's how it works. That's how deception works. That's how sin works. But it, it's also true when things are okay. So it's not really a good indicator because you're going to say that you're okay whether things are going bad or good. So, uh, but, um, you know, Judah, they were always saying, oh, no, we're okay. And God's telling them, hey, no, you guys need to stop. And they're just like, no, we're fine. Um, and so without seeking God, we, we don't really know whether we're okay or not. And, uh, you know, Judah thought that they were okay, but they thought that they weren't that bad. Like, I oh, know we're fine. We're pretty good people. And that speaks to me because oftentimes that's my tendency is to say, you know, I'm okay. I don't need to change. I'm fine how I am. And Jeremiah shows me that, no, I, I actually do need to still have God weigh my heart no matter how righteous I think that I am. Uh, another message that, that I, I kind of see from Jeremiah is everybody faces daily temptation to sin. And when they do sin, it kind of entangles and uh, many times Christians can become kind of very stubborn in their bad attitudes and don't really want to want to turn. Uh, there was there was a, a woman um, that uh, when I was when I was still the associate pastor at the church, um, she was 
committing adultery. And we were trying to work with her to get her to, you know, stop. <laughs> and uh, that, that didn't, didn't overly work that well, actually, at all. And, uh, you know, some of the conversations, like, at first when we started talking to her, it was more like, you know, trying to defend herself, like, oh, well, you don't know what, you don't know what the spouse did and all this different stuff. And uh, then eventually she got to, got to another level of the argument where she was just, oh, well, I, I haven't done anything wrong. Like, th there's nothing wrong with what we're doing. And it's like, but there is. <laughs> I mean, you guys are cheating. And, well, you know, the spouse started at first and it's like, okay, this is getting way too complicated. Like, Wrong is not justifying wrong. If there needs to be something happening there, that's different. But I mean, that doesn't mean you need to make it make a bad situation worse. Um, there was another woman, and and this got so awkward. She had a history of of cheating on on her husband, and so her husband obviously was kind of piota at her, and uh, uh, so and she just got kind of discouraged, obviously, because the situation was so bad. And but she kept going and sleeping with these people, and then she kept getting upset with her husband for not like taking her back, and it just got really messy. So she got the bright idea of having a three way with her husband and her best friend, and then she got the bright idea of talking to me about it. And it was just like, oh, oh. Did yes, real, real. you hear some crazy things as a pastor, crazy things as a pastor. And uh, the whole time, she was never able to just learn the lesson. Like, she would live in guilt the whole time. Like, oh, I messed up here, I messed up. But then she'd keep on going back and doing it. And then when you try to talk to her about it, it'd be like, well, I don't need to really change anything I'm doing in my life. You're just trying to manipulate me. And it's like, I'm trying to, what? Like, no, I'm trying to help you get out of this pickle that you keep getting yourself into. Um, another example that I, that I was thinking of when I was writing this lesson was... <coughs> There was there was a, a person that was volunteering for the church with different different cleaning things and whatnot, and uh, they did a great job. Just I, no complaints about their work, but they had this really nasty attitude. And they were always nitpicking everyone else. They were one of those people who always had something bad to say about you. You know what I mean? Like you'd say something, and they just say something snide to cut you down, over and over and over again, over and over and over again. And um, I, I, I tried talking to this person. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, that's really not showing Christ. And they just wouldn't listen. Like, no, I'm not doing anything wrong. It's, it's, it, and then she even tried to blame it on her ex-husband. And I was just like, he's not here. Like, you're here. And uh, we, we, we like to get in sin. And I think Jeremiah really has something to say to us for that. Um, to help us, you know, get out of sin. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, we are all prone to getting off track, spiritually speaking, all of us. This is not something that one person is more prone, everybody. Pastors are prone to it, just regular churchgoers are prone to it, worship leaders are prone to it. Every Christian is prone to getting off track with God. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to be hurt or you're just going to be bored. That's going to happen too in your Christian walk. There's going to be times when you are bored. Like you just, blah, I don't care if I go to church. Like I'm just... I'm over the people. I'm over the situation. I'm just over it. And that's normal. It totally happens to everybody. And um, sometimes we won't be so dedicated to living God's ways. We, we all want our own way in life. And, and, and we always all want to live life on our own terms without God interfering with us. That's something that we're all going to struggle with. We're all going to face. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes what some people do is they try to mix things from the culture, like Gracie talked about Wiccans. Uh, I've known people who try to have Ouija boards and, 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 and be drunks and, and, and lazy and, and, and do all this nonsense. And it's like that you can't, you can't mix the two. And, uh, so Jeremiah has something to say to us, you know, cause we are prone to get off track spiritually. And Jeremiah has a message of us about coming back to God. And um, I, I really think that that's a timeless message, that even though we are so different than Judah was back then, in a lot of ways we're still people and we're still well, just the same. So we're going to stop there. And uh, if you want to be prepared for not next week, but the week after, uh, read Jeremiah 3 and 4.